So there's like a couple more things I want to like uh, discuss here regarding that essay, which is uh, this idea of skin hunger. And I had mm-hmm. read the essay from the book that it was adapted from, which is much more substantial, much longer. And I could tell that when you adapted it for publication in uh, New, York, New York Times Magazine, that you included the caveat that we are now mm-hmm. in the middle of or, a, you know, in the midst of this pandemic where this idea of skin hunger mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. M- being more commonly experienced because people are lacking touch because they're socially distancing and isolating themselves and so on. And that's something that I definitely experienced for months at a time, you know, mm-hmm. where I where mm-hmm. I'm at. So I think I know that you wrote that. I think I imagine you wrote the original essay before the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I did. I did. Yeah. And, you know, it's like skin hunger. It feels like a term that lots of people know now. But when I first wrote that essay and like, as I drafted it uh, near the end of 2018, um, mm-hmm. I had never heard of such a thing. And yeah, it, it was written in a very, very different time. And I was actually really grateful that I got the opportunity to sort of reshape and kind of re-envision it somewhat for the Times Magazine, because when the book came out, it was one of those things where I sort of wished I could insert a little preface to that essay and be like, <laughs> this is going to hit a little bit differently now that everybody knows what skin <laughs> hunger is and has to yeah. some extent experienced it. Um, and also just to sort of follow up on some of the ideas that I'd written about in the original essay and think about the ways the pandemic had developed or changed my experience of those things. Because Mm -hmm. I think while, you know, the isolation of the pandemic was really, really hard for a lot of people, myself included, for me, there were aspects of it that felt like a huge relief because there was no expectation that I engage in or yield to any forms of touch I didn't want to. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something that really came clearly through the essay is the um yeah, this idea of un- unwanted touch, but also this other this concept that you work with, this term uh, empty consent. Mm-hmm. Um could you describe what that is? Sure. Um so after I you know started writing about my experience at the cuddle party, um what I I sort of followed this trail of breadcrumbs or memories back through my own experience, trying to answer the question of why did I, at the time, like a 37-year-old lifelong feminist and college professor, why was I cuddling with strange, feeling pressured to cuddle with strangers, Mm -hmm. even in an environment where it was expressly encouraged that I say no if I didn't want to do that? I was like, what happened? So I went back through my own experience and um, really quickly discovered that I've been doing that my whole life. Um, And once that became clear and the sort of total understandability of my response to the environment of the cuddle party, um, I had this really strong desire to talk to other people about it. And so I started talking to my friends um, and then I started talking to friends of friends and, you know, again, it became clear really, really quickly that this was an experience I was not alone in. And as I was conducting those conversations, I found myself in this really cumbersome way having to continue um, sort of summarizing the dynamic and saying, you know, were there lots of instances where you consented to forms of touch about which you felt ambivalent or actively didn't want? And I was basically saying that long, (laughs) tedious phrase over Mm -hmm. and over and over again. And I thought it was really sort of uh, utilitarian. I was like, I just need a a shorter phrase to Mm -hmm. stand in for this experience and there isn't a name for it. So I I was really just a descriptive title, empty consent, um, which seemed to pretty get to the point of what the experience was. And then as soon as I started using it, it was really interesting because the women I was talking to, they weren't all women, just the interviews they used in the essay were, but Mm -hmm. um, the people I was talking to, immediately picked up on it and started using it as if it was a word we had both known before. And what that showed me was how, how desperately we needed a name for our experience and how much easier it becomes to talk about things once we have a name for them. Yeah. It seems that, cause there's another uh, part of this and I, I don't know if it's, I can't remember if it's um, in the 
version that was published in New York Times Magazine or if it was in the longer essay in the book itself. But the the way that you're trying to navigate the nuances and the kind of spaces in between where something, for instance, like trauma is something that you are resistant to using to describe many of your experiences and how you react to certain situations that you were in, like at the cuddle party, for instance, you talked about mm-hmm. that, you know, that repulsion you had, the empty consent and so on. Mm-hmm. But you're like, that wasn't trauma or a trauma response per se, but instead you use the word event, like these were events. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what I want to ask you about that, because I do think that trauma is something that we mm-hmm. use to describe a lot of things that may not fit under that 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 right. definition or that right. word. But yeah, I want to ask you why you mm-hmm. chose to define it. Uh, using a different term like an event Mm -hmm. versus trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, probably you, like me, like most of us are experiencing this kind of burnout from the use of the word trauma. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, we we, we come by it honestly. I think we're in a moment where our culture is becoming more willing to acknowledge harms that before were unacknowledged and that our culture had an investment in not acknowledging sort of the, the micro or granular ways that people are harmed by living in a patriarchal white supremacist society. Um, but we haven't coined terms for these gradations of harm as fast as we've become willing to name them. And so we're just using the word trauma for all of it. Right. Mm-hmm. And for me, as I was sort of doing that detective work back into my own story, trying to figure out why I had consented to touch I didn't want, there were all of these events, all of these experiences that contained that dynamic. And, you know, some of them, like I remember when I first started dating Danica, I described to her some of my early sexual experiences and she was like, "Mm, those sound pretty traumatic. Yeah. And I was like, no, I consented to them. They weren't traumatic. Like I, I, there's no way that I was willing and I still don't feel willing to classify my like yucky experiences that I consented to, to put them on a shelf with people I know who had been like violently assaulted or, you know, yeah. there are so many um, more sensational forms of trauma. Right. Um, but the, the problem with being unwilling to do that is that then I didn't have another word to describe them. And so it creates this kind of false binary between trauma and not trauma. And I was like, well, these are not capital T trauma. So clearly they go in the not trauma category. And therefore I never thought to examine them more closely or think about the ways that they'd affected me long-term. And so when I was really sort of getting out my little magnifying glass and writing this essay, I thought, well, we need more words, right? Like, because Mm -hmm. I still don't want to use big T trauma to describe, you know, things that were definitely not assault, but which affected me, you know, in lasting ways. And so, you know, using the word event was really just a way of sort of indicating that I think our lexicon needs to expand to include words to describe the whole spectrum of harm that goes beyond, uh, you know, assault and things we've consented to. Yeah, and there's this I mean I really appreciated that a lot and how you were trying to navigate this it's a somewhat tricky territory here. Um because you also mentioned this uh you know this idea of um uh, affirmative consent or or um mm-hmm. so the idea of like if you're having a sexual interaction interaction with a person every step of the way there needs to be like a moment to say i consent to this or i or i do not consent to this you know that mm-hmm. so that you know the idea that we've had in the very patriarchal history of this culture is like i mean get back to the roots of like if you're mm-hmm. a woman in a marriage you have no right to you, you, there's nothing you've already consented mm-hmm. to everything that can happen to you from the husband right mm-hmm. so like moving away from that you know we need to really understand that even in the midst of like a intimate experience with somebody that there are times when you can just say no and that should be okay um and what you reflect on in your essay at the cuddle party is you you know you you there was something like empty consent that occurred there where Mm -hmm. you basically said yes uh, you know some man asked you to cuddle and you said Mm 
yes, but you didn't really want it. And you、mm-hmm. had to kind of take time after to reflect on why that even happened,、mm-hmm. you know. And so I feel、mm-hmm. like so much of like, yeah, talking about it through the trauma lens is maybe not useful because、mm-hmm. it is such a powerful idea and experience that people have.、Mm-hmm. But there's like this. You talked about it like as if there's like a pathway that was. How did you say it exactly? There was like a lifetime、mm-hmm. of experiences,、mm-hmm. and once a certain、uh, experience, once you had that experience at the cuddle party, it's like this thing kicked in. It doesn't matter how much、mm-hmm. you've educated yourself and、mm-hmm. learned about how these all these patriarchal structures function and operate. You still f- like, unfortunately, fell back into that, like、mm-hmm. doing something、yeah. you really didn't want to do.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean, in many ways, you know the. The whole book is sort of about this, right? And I don't think that it's something that just happens to women. That we've we have particular, you know, stories that we share in our society about what sex is, right? And we take those for granted because we've been absorbing them for our whole lives. And you know, they include things like once you've said yes, or once the sexual interaction has started, you can't stop. And change your mind at any point,、right. and I'm sure that there. Are, I know that there are particular implications for men. They have their specific scripts where, you know,、yeah. I, you know, and some of the people I interviewed, I interviewed some men when I was writing this book, and and for them it was also like you can't stop and say you're no longer interested or it's moving too fast because you're supposed to have this voracious sexual appetite that knows、mm. no bounds, right?、Yeah. And so, what you have are people who are sort of.、Um, Enacting a kind of loyalty to a narrative about what's normal or what sex is, when actually it violates what one or both parties want, right?、Mm-hmm. And so, like, for me, a big part of writing this essay was really digging into sort of what is the story about sex that I've taken for granted that I can actually rewrite with what I want it to be, you know? And when you think about, you know, how empty consent. Is represented culturally, and so far as it is, it's like a joke and taken for granted. Where it's like, oh yeah, you know, like women faking orgasms or having to sort of suffer through your husband's sexual desire when you don't really want. To. It's like a cliche, a gross cliche. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's the manner in which these things get normalized and suddenly are like under the banner of like regular healthy sex, even though.、Um, They're not at all what we want or believe in.